We've been looking primarily at the parables of the kingdom of heaven. And so that's, Matthew's a very difficult book to understand at times. And that's why I've decided to study it with you. Because a lot of people are intimidated by the Bible sometimes. They say, I just don't understand it. I don't understand Matthew. There's some things in there. Well, that's because you have to rightly divide. And I've been, we've emphasized that here in Sunday school that we want you to understand the Bible so that you can enjoy reading it, amen, and understand where does that fit in God's uh, economy. The Bible calls it economia, and that Greek word comes out to dispensation. So God's economy is the way God uh, organizes things, and he's a householder. We've seen that in the last parable, a householder. And God's a householder, and God's a steward, and he wants us to be wise stewards. Amen? And part of that is understanding your Bible and being able to apply the Bible in the right way. If you don't understand the Bible, you're not going to apply it the right way, and you could do a lot of damage. A lot of preachers today are, are millennial and post-millennial. They do away with Israel. They don't believe in the promises of God to Israel that he will restore them, and that one day they will enter into the kingdom. And so they're bad householders. Many of them are lost. Many of them aren't even saved. If you, if you believe what they teach, which is modernism and liberalism, uh, it's universalism, that God knows it and goes to hell. There isn't even a hell anymore. So, uh, and a lot of them are by their works. They believe they're saved. So if you believe what they're teaching, then you wouldn't be saved. And many of them, uh, if, if they are saved, they've gotten off into some false doctrine along the way, and that's why we need to study the book of Matthew. Matthew is a transitional book, and it's a, going from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And you've got to watch certain books of the Bible. We've repeated it, and I'll repeat it again, that those books take you from one period of the dispensation to another one. And so you'll see that with the book of Matthew. So beware when somebody tries to teach to you doctrinally in the church age out of the book of Matthew. We can spiritually get things out of Matthew, but that is not the foundational uh, place for the Christian to study for his doctrine. The place for a Christian to study his doctrine is going to be from Romans to Philemon. Another transitional book is the book of Acts. Beware of those that will try to take the book of Acts and apply portions of it to tell you this is what you need to do to be saved. For instance, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, which says... Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins. We don't preach that today, amen? We don't preach that you need to be, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And so that's a transitional book. So you need to beware. Write these down. Matthew, Acts. Uh, when somebody tries to teach doctrine out of Matthew, they're going to put you under the yoke of the law. 100%. They're going to take you to the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount. They're going to say, this is how a Christian should live. Well, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the meek, blessed are the, uh, the poor in spirit. Uh, that, Jesus is speaking to the nation of Israel, and he's laying down a constitution for the millennial kingdom, which is future. Paul teaches different things than Jesus taught. Jesus said, call, uh, he said, if you call a man, thou fool, you will be in danger of hell fire. Paul said to the Galatians, oh foolish Galatians. Uh, there's differences, you'll see that, what Paul teaches and what Jesus taught. And when you try to assimilate and make them the same, you're going to have all kinds of her heresy. And that's what the Catholic Church does. That's what the Protestant churches are doing. They try to assimilate and say all the New Testament, Matthew through Revelation, is all Christian doctrine. And it's not. There's a lot of things in the Bible that is not for you doctrinally. Amen. And you've got to divide the scriptures. And so what we're doing here in Matthew 22, uh, we're seeing how God's dealing with Israel. And this is the tenth parable which begins... Uh, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto. So we've been looking at the kingdom of heaven parables. And this is the tenth one. And this one here uh, is going to deal with uh, the Jews in his day, in Christ's day. He's saying that there's go you were invited as guests to the wedding. And we're going to see here that they didn't want to come to the wedding. And this is going to get real deep. The doctrinal application is going to be hard for you. Maybe you never heard this before, but you're going to find that there's a bride at the wedding, that's the church. We are not guests at the wedding, amen? Uh, you can look at uh, 
Revelation 19.7. Look there, Revelation 19.7. Let's uh, read this and then we'll pray. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true saints of God. Let's pray. Father, we pray for wisdom as we study these things out of the book of Matthew, that it would be understood by all of us, Lord, and, and we would search out the scriptures and be able to compare scripture with scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. And we pray, God, that you'd give us a little to this morning, God. Uh, just open our eyes and our, of our understanding a little bit more as we study the Word of God this morning. Give us some scriptures that will enlighten us and strengthen us and encourage us in faith. And we pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, so here we have a, a marriage. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, verse 2, which made a marriage for his son. Now, with a bride is going to be the bride is going to be Jesus Christ's bride, the church. And the people that come now are going to be guests. Uh, Israel will be a guest at the wedding. The Israelites. That's what he's saying here. And he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. So we're going to see uh, two groups here. And I, I think that the ones who should have been worthy to come were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the leaders of Israel. And he invited them. He invited Israel to come. And uh, they began, in verse 4, began to make excuse not to come. And uh, the Jews did not come. They rejected his invitation. The Bible says he came unto his own. They didn't want it. He invited them to, the, to be part of it. They didn't want to come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed. And all those are sacrifices. He's made sacrifice. And all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. Now, the, the common way people will teach us now is the Jews got it first, and then God went out to the Gentiles. And that's, that's a good application spiritually. You could look at this and say, I got in because somebody didn't want to wear the wedding garment. But the verse-by-verse verse teaching is that there, there's a bride here, there's a, there's a groom, but then there are some guests. And if you go back, I think it's Psalms 45. Let's go back there. Look in Psalms 45. Let me see where that verse was. So there's a wedding here. Look at verse 07. Thou lovest righteousness, that's about Jesus, and hatest wickedness. Because the Father calls his Son God in verse 6. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. That's the Father speaking. That's Hebrews 1, uh, verses 3 through 5 there. Now, thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God. God has a God. <laughs> there's a trinity. Therefore, God, thy God. He's speaking about Jesus. Thy God is the Father. Otherwise, you got two gods there. Amen? Just proper grammar. Therefore, God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. All thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia out of the ivory palaces, whereby we even sing a hymn called Out of the Ivory Palaces, Wherefore, whereby they have made thee glad. Now, this is Israel. King's daughters were among thy honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in the gold of Ophir. There's a queen. And there'll be a church that's the queen. She's going to stand by Christ's uh, right hand. In verse 10, Hearken, O daughter, and consider and incline thine ear. Forget also thine own people and thy father's house. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy Lord, and worship thou him. And the daughter of Tyre shall be there with a gift. Even the rich among the people shall entreat thy favor. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of brought gold. She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework. The virgins, there's going to be some virgins at the wedding. 
Uh, remember, now those virgins, where do you find those? Anybody know where that's in the Bible? Who can find those virgins in the New Testament? Throw your hand up, somebody. Joel, I saw a wink there. Where's that at? Well, what's the idea, though? What, you don't have to know the, right now the chapter verse, but what's that allude to? See, the church is one virgin, right? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11 that I might present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But the virgins are plural. Where do you find plural virgins in the New Testament, Dina? Right, ten virgins went out with their lamps. Matthew 25, verse 1. And five were ready and five were not. Right? They went out to a what? A wedding. And a lot of people are going to teach, that's the church. And some Christians aren't ready and they have not committed themselves to Christ. And when Christ comes at the rapture, some are going to be left behind. That is not the Bible teaching. No one's going to be left behind if you're saved. Amen? The dead in Christ shall rise first. We shall all be changed, Paul, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15. But we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. There's not going to be two groups, those that are left behind and those that are taken in the body of Christ. So who are those ten virgins? That's Israel. Those, that's work salvation in Matthew chapter 25. They go out and they don't have enough oil. So what do they got to do to get the Holy Spirit back? They got to go out and buy more. They got to purchase it. Does this make sense? Amen? You don't buy the Holy Spirit today, do you? How many of you were able to buy the Holy Ghost, buy oil in your lamp? No. You can't. It's by grace. For by grace are you saved. Grace means you can't pay for it. You received it freely. It's called the free gift in Romans chapter 5. It's a free gift, salvation. For by, it says, for, for the wage of the sin is death, but the gift of God right now is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But in the tribulation, the Lord's coming back at the end of the tribulation, there will be Jews who are ready and Jews who are not ready. And there's going to be a rapture again at the end when the bridegroom cometh, Matthew 25. That isn't for the church, that's for Israel. And there are going to be Jews who endure to the end, and there are going to be Jews who don't endure to the end, and they run out of God's Spirit. And they say, well, will you lend us some of yours? And they say, no, lest we don't have it ourselves. We're not, we can't give it to you. you got to go and get, get it yourself. And when they went to go buy it, the bridegroom came, and the door was shut, and they were left out like Noah's Ark. <laughs> so when you read this here, and every, all these scriptures mean something. He says, there's going to be virgins at the wedding. Verse 14, she shall be brought into the king in the raiment of needlework. That's, that's going to be fine linen, white, uh, clean and white. The virgins, her companions that follow her, shall be brought unto thee. With gladness and rejoicing, they shall be brought, they shall enter into the king's palace. Instead of thy father shall be thy children, whom thou mayest make princes in all the earth. I will make thy name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore shall the people praise thee forever and ever. So as we get into this, we notice that these are not a bride at coming to a wedding. These are guests coming to a wedding. Now I'll tell you something. I know that goes against your grain. You read this verse maybe and thought, well, Jesus said I went to the Jews and they were invited to the wedding, but then they didn't want to come. So go out and invite other people, and that's the Gentiles. But the, the proper doctrinal application here is these Jews did not want it when Christ came the first time. And these are guests. Well, the second group are guests too. Now we go on a little further. And uh, we get down here to verse 5, 6, 7. What's it say? But they made light of it. They, didn't, they rejected Christ. I'm trying to find my glasses. Okay. And the raiment, and, uh, the raiment took his uh, servants and entreated them spitefully. And the remnant took his servants and treated him spitefully and slew them. And that, uh, it's talking about the prophets. In another parable it says, uh, at the last he sent his son, if you'll remember, where they took the vineyard. I believe that's in chapter 21. I didn't go into that parable today because I'm sticking with the kingdom of heaven parables specifically. And here you have um, a picture of the prophets came, and then lastly, in another parable, he sent his son and said, surely they will revere him, and they killed him. 
In this one, that it, it pictures the first coming. And then what happened in 70 A.D. is found in verse 7. Uh, the Lord destroyed Jerusalem and killed those murderers. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. So they, uh, were, they rejected the Lord, and especially in the book of Acts, they're given another opportunity, and they reject Stephen in the preaching again. And that's where the Lord said, that's the last straw. And at that point, he cut them off, and he destroyed their city. Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple's destroyed, and the temple's not there now. And without a temple, the city's not, uh, for a Jew, without a temple, there's no communication with God. And uh, they're going to get their desire in the tribulation. The Antichrist is going to let them build the temple. That's what every Jew desires now, Orthodox Jew. They want to build the temple in Jerusalem. Why? Uh, they want to communicate with God and sacrifice again. Well, we know the temple will be rebuilt because the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that he shall stand in the temple showing himself that he is God. Uh, so he's going to stand in the temple and defile it in the tribulation. So let's, uh, seven, verse 7 is a picture of history, what's going to happen to them. He, he, prof he prophesied what's going to happen to the, to the Jews in, in that time. Now there's a future time when God's going to get, open a door to a, another group that are going to be found worthy. And he uses the word worthy. Verse 8, Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. All right, well, let's look at that verse there a little bit. What's worthy mean? Look at back in Matthew chapter 10. And we'll see what the Lord declares about these Jews. How He said, go not to the Gentiles. So it's kind of in contradiction uh, about this parable. He didn't send them out to the Gentiles. He said, I want my people to be saved. And he sent them out, and the Bible says in verse 11, And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who, is in, who in it is worthy. How did they inquire? We'll read a little further. And there abide till you go thence. And when you come into a house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words... That's how they were found worthy. If they wouldn't hear the gospel, they wouldn't receive Christ. He said, go out and preach good tidings. Preach the, the gospel that Christ, the Messiah, has come. And uh, they that sit in darkness have seen a great light. And uh, whosoever will receive the word in, the, in those days when Jesus sent them forth, they're worthy. And uh, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off if they will not, and whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And so many of the Jews rejected Christ in that time. And I believe that the ones who were found worthy, many of them were just people who were lame and halt, of the Jews, many did receive Christ. So in, a, in the first application you can see here, I think he said, I came in to the Pharisees and they heard the gospel, but you know who received it? The, the common people, the poor people, the sick, people uh, like fishermen, like Peter and tax collectors. So verse 8, they then said he to his servants, the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. What? They had too much, uh, if you read the other parable, they had too many things. One had to check out a team of oxen, another one purchased a, a, a parcel of land, another man, had, um, I think he, uh, I can't remember what his reason was, but there were three excuses made in another parable. And here, uh, verse 9, Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So, um, get other guests. And they have to have a wedding garment. And that's what makes them worthy. Even in the tribulation, whenever God uh, opens the door again to the Jews. So this parable, in a way, skips the church age. Because there's going to be a time when the Jews are going to receive the Lord again. There's going to be a group of Jews in the future, in the tribulation, who are going to return to the Lord. And they're going to say, we want those wedding garments. Look in Revelation chapter 6, verse 
11. They will humble themselves. They will not reject the Lord the second time. The second group will not turn their hearts away from the Lord. They will turn unto the Lord. Right now the law is keeping them from turning to the Lord. That's in oh, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, I think. I can't remember, four, chapter 4, I believe. It says, then it shall turn to the Lord their heart. There's a veil upon their eyes right now of the law. But in the tribulation, they're going to turn to the Lord. In verse 11 it says, And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest for a little season until their fellowship also, uh, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Look in chapter 7, verse 9. Just a little further over. After this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. So these people are wearing a garment that the Lord gave them. And they have wedding garments on. I'll give you another verse on this. Look at Isaiah 61.10. Isaiah 61. If you, even then, there's different times where men are saved in different ways, but you still have to be saved. You, had to be, you always have to be delivered by the Lord. You're saved. Even in the tribulation, they have to be saved. And here we have 61 and verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorned herself with her jewels. And that's even picturing the church there. You and I have a wedding garment. We have the bride's dress. Amen? That she will, we will be arrayed gloriously. Boy, you have something that even will make the Jewish people envious in the future. Amen? We're the bride. And she hath clothed herself. You look at verse 9. It even talks about the Gentiles. And their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them, that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. Well, look back here in Matthew, something interesting. Look at Matthew chapter 8. Now, there's a spiritual application, too, as I was saying. We got to enter in because the Jews rejected it. The primary application is future Jews that are going to come in and get to sit in the wedding. But I can apply this to me and you in a way, this parable also spiritually. Because in Matthew 8, Jesus said that there's going to be people come in that the Jews should have been, the children of the kingdom should have got it. Look in 8, 11, spiritually here, uh, the church age. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. You and I got to enter in to the kingdom of future kingdom of heaven. Why? Because the church age was open to the Gentiles. That was not originally, you know, God's plan, but Jesus warned them right here. Even in John, he says, uh, my sheep know my voice, but he says, and the other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. He was already making indications in the Gospels that I'm going to open the door to the Gentiles because you were not worthy. You didn't want to hear the word. Look in verse 12, but the children of the kingdom, that's the house of Israel, the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So these ones in verse 11 are not the children of the kingdom by nature. Many is speaking about those that come in from the Gentiles. And they got to come in. So it's a picture also in this parable. I don't want to confuse things because there's two applications. Doctrinally, doctrinally is Israel. And God still has a remnant that will be saved. And they will return to the Lord. But spiritually, you can apply that parable to you and I and say, we are the many that came in because the children of the kingdom didn't want it. And God opened a door for the church and the Gentiles to come in. And so verse 8, uh, chapter 8, verse. notice how it says in verse 12, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So if you go back now to our parable in chapter 22, Matthew chapter 22, 
it ends with that same wording. Uh, look at verse 13. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He said the children of the kingdom are going to be those who rejected the invitation, who didn't want to put on the garments of salvation, who didn't want to come in as a guest. And the Lord says here, friend, <laughs> he comes and finds them. The Lord's going to judge men based on what their righteousness is. That garment is either you have it or you don't. In the Oriental wedding, you had to have the garments on to go in. That was your ticket. If you didn't have the right clothes on and there was wedding garments for that, you weren't allowed to come in. Somehow this guy snuck in. Let's go back to our parable, Matthew 22. Verse 9, go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both good and bad, and the wedding was furnished with guests. Now, I don't know what that good and bad, bad and good, I'm sorry, I got it wrong. Bad and good, bad's first. <laughs> bad and good. And I guess there could be some application here to the church age, because you might say the good were the Jews, and they were the ones that he were his first, the worthy ones that should have been worthy. The first, they'll be the last. We saw that in another parable. And the last shall be first. And so by nature, the Gentiles are bad. <laughs> by nature, we're uncircumcised heathen. We're the dogs that, go, that can eat under the table. And the Lord says there's good and bad in this church. There's Jew, neither Jew nor Jew. There's Jew and Gentile by the flesh. But in the eyes of the Lord, they're all guests. So that's the spiritual application here. So those servants went. And then verse 11, And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. He slipped through. And the picture is that somebody, when you stand for the judgment, you might be at the wedding, you think, but the Lord's going to look and say, you don't have my righteousness. You don't have the garments on. You don't belong here. And uh, the application is there's going to be many Pharisees who kept the law, who outwardly were circumcised. Outwardly, they did everything according to the law, but they did not have a heart circumcised. And they didn't, have a, they didn't have a knowledge of God. They didn't know God. They didn't believe in His Word. They didn't believe on Jesus Christ. That's how you get the wedding garment. They rejected the Savior. And so the Lord says, uh, friend. Doesn't he say friend here? And verse 12, and he saith unto him, friend. That's interesting. That reminds me of uh, the Antichrist. <laughs> you say, what are you talking about? Son of perdition. There was one sitting at the table with Jesus and all the disciples. And there's a deep study on that thing. Um, he was called the son of Simon. Did you ever read in your Bible there was a Pharisee who, who, had, who opened up his house and Jesus ate at his house? And he was called Simon the leper. How I many you remember that? In Bethany, there was a Simon the leper. And it was in that house that Judas Iscariot criticized the woman that broke her alabaster box and said, this could have been sold for 200, I forget how much money, 300 pence, and given to the poor. Not because he cared for the poor, the Bible says, but because he held the bag. That was weird too. Why wasn't Matthew... The receipt of customs, the guy who was attacked, why didn't he hold the bag? He would have been a natural treasurer, right? How did Judas Iscariot finagle his way into holding the bag? You know, watch out. <laughs> but this guy here, Jesus calls Judas Iscariot friend. Remember when he kissed him? He said friend. Uh, where's that at? I don't remember where that's in the Bible. Look at Matthew 26, 50. Just a couple pages over. Uh, just an interesting thing. That there's going to be people who are fakes. That's what we saw back in the, one of the very earliest of the parables with the wheat and the tares. And the Lord's going to expose them and say, you're not a true guest. You don't have the wedding garments. You don't have salvation. And it says here in 26 and verse 50, And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Almost the same wording as this thing here. Where he says, and he saith unto him, friend, how camest thou in hither? Wherefore art thou come? <laughs> What'd you come here for? What are you doing at the, you just want to eat? You just here to get some free food? You don't want to honor me? You don't want to really recognize what this is all about? 
It's me and my bride. You didn't come here. You never believed on me. What are you doing here? And people are going to come to the Lord and say, Lord, Lord, haven't we in thy name? And the Lord's going to say, my name? You never believed on my name. Why would you use my name? Remember those sons of Shiva that, and, they, and the devil uh, tore their clothes off? And they said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? <laughs> Remember that story? And they ran out naked out of the house. I mean, they don't know Jesus. They don't, he doesn't know them either. And so Jesus calls them friend because Christ is a friend to all sinners. He, he could save anyone. But they're not his friend. He says in another place in Psalms where he says, but he was my, what does it say, companion, familiar friend. You know, it's in Psalms somewhere. He talks about it would have been easier if it were an enemy, but he was my close, I can't remember that psalm, but there's a psalm and they're talking about Judas Iscariot. I bet there's a reference in Matthew 26 to that. Okay, let's read that. Psalms 41.9. Thank you, sister. Psalms 41, 9. And it says here, oh, he's, he says, um, that's, that's it, but that's not the verse I was thinking of, but that's a good one. Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. He calls him a friend here. There's another verse I was thinking that was, uh, but I can't remember how it's quoted now. But he says, um, if it were an enemy, that would be one thing. And he doesn't even use the word friend. This is an even better verse, actually, because it says familiar friend that lifted up the heel against me. And, um, yeah, let's look there. Thank you, sister. 55.12. Yep. It would be easy to handle, he said, if it were my enemy, for it was not an enemy that reproached me. Then I could have borne it. I could have, that would have, I would have been bearable. I could have you know, handled it. Neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me. Then I would have hid myself from him. But it was thou, a man mine equal, my guide, and mine acquaintance. Here, Jesus is scary. He ate at his table. And he was one of the disciples. But Jesus said, I have not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil. Uh, I won't go into too much depth, but you look in uh, John thirteen thirteen. he says, um, he says, uh, before he spake about what Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, that thing there, he says, you call me, in that text there, he calls you, you see, you call me master and Lord. Judas Iscariot, in the same passage, says, master, is it I? He does not call Jesus Lord. He never accepted him as his Lord. Also interesting enough, that Pharisee, Simon the leper, says, master. He doesn't call Jesus Lord. They don't believe on, on him as the Lord. They just believe he was a good teacher. That's what master means, good teacher. They didn't say, you're Lord. And so Jesus said, you call me two things, master and Lord. The other disciples called Jesus Lord. But one of them in their group didn't call him Lord. He called him master. And that was one who kissed him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And called him, and Jesus called him friend to fulfill scripture. It was a familiar friend. He ate with me. He even took the, he was there at the Lord's Supper and dipped the sop, dipped the bread. He said, it, Who is it, Lord? Who will betray you? Is it I? Is it I? They all began to ask, Is it I? And the Lord said, It is the one who shall dip the sop. Isn't that a neat word, sop? Y'all like acronyms? What's your initials for your? Your name. Mine's EJK. You know whose initials that was? The Sop. The Son of Perdition. <laughs> Isn't that a quinky dinky? He's a master. He didn't call him Lord. What did he do? He dipped his sop into the. I love the King James Bible. I bet those other versions changed the word sop. I'll guarantee you they changed that Son of Perdition. There's the key. He's a SOP. He's not an SOB. He's an SOP. That's even worse. <laughs> Nothing worse than the son of perdition. <laughs> you son of a perdition, man. <laughs> perdition is uh, Abaddon, Apollyon. That's what that means. He's over there in Revelation. 
He is called the son of perdition in John chapter 17. Jesus said, I, he chose 12, he says there, look at that. I know we're getting a little bit into something else, but he calls him friend right there in the wedding. You got people that are trying to get in around Jesus and say, oh, I'm his friend. I'm, but he never believed on them. There's a lot of fakers. There's a lot of people today that are in churches and they're not even born again. You ask them, how are you going to heaven? Well, I try my best and I'm a good person. <clears throat> You're going to hell. Well, I believe in the sacraments and I really, I know Christ he's, was sacrificed and, but I, and I believe that I was baptized as a child and I've kept, uh, I've communion and I've, uh, I've, 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 you're going to hell. <laughs> Thumbs down. Take another flame. You're going to stand before Jesus one day and they're all going to say, Lord, ha Lord, haven't I done all these good works? Oh, look, I've, done, I've cast out devils. I believe Judas Iscariot cast out devils. Why? If those 12 went out and they were all casting out devils and they look over here and there's Judas Iscariot, what's wrong with you? Why can't you do it? They all came back rejoicing because they were able to do these things in Christ's name. And many are going to say, Lord, Lord, haven't we cast out devils and in thy name done many, many wonderful works? And the Lord said, depart from me, ye wicked, into everlasting fire. I never knew you. You don't have the garments on. Where would I say to go? What verses what were we going to look at? I forgot now. Look at John 17. So Jesus is talking about Judas Iscariot here. And he says in verse 12, he's, this is really the Lord's Prayer. If you want to have like something in the Bible called the Lord's Prayer, this is it. All of chapter 17. This is different. They call the, the Lord's Prayer, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. No, this is the Lord's Prayer. He's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane here, and here's what he prayed. And part of the Lord's Prayer was verse 12. While I was with them in the world, that's the 12 disciples, I, the apostles, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the Scripture might be fulfilled. Well, there's only one person that could be. That's Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. S-O-N, by the way, is in italics over in John. And I believe that he raised him as his son, like Joseph raised Jesus and was supposed to be the son of Joseph. He wasn't his son. I believe that something happened, that that man was born as a devil. Bible, Jesus said, have I not chosen you 12? John chapter 6, verse 72. And one of you is a devil. That isn't a natural born person when you're called a devil by Jesus Christ. And you can go into a lot of scriptures. He went unto his own place. That's his place. It's called the, the uh, bottomless pit. And he's going to come back up out of the bottomless pit. And he will assume the throne. And he will be the Antichrist. In the second half of the tribulation, he will have Satan incarnate in the flesh. And this thing here in uh, John 17, Jesus calls him that name. That name comes up in Second. Thessalonians, one more time. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And I believe there's going to be that spirit returning into a man through wicked means. Just like angels knew women back in Genesis 6, Satan is going to have a child, Rosemary's baby. Hollywood doesn't get anything original. It's out of the Bible. How many of you saw Rosemary's baby? No, you don't want to see it. <laughs> We watched that back in the 70s. That's a scary movie. What you get? A woman had to, gave birth to, of a child through the devil. Rose Mary. Mary, get it? Yeah. Mary had a baby. Well, Jesus was, Mary had a little lamb. Amen. But this is Rosemary. It's trying to imitate Jesus Christ. There's all these key words. But here it says here in chapter 2, let no man, verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Judas Iscariot's coming back. He's going to come back, and he's going to reign again for three and a half years, and he's going to sit upon a throne, and it's the seat of Satan, and he's going to say, I am God. That's what it says right here in verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, 
showing himself that he is God. And then we're in this parable, and it's kind of getting into this friend thing. But Judas Iscariot is a picture of people who can hang out with Jesus, who can be around apostles and disciples, and appear to be a believer, and one day that will all be exposed because they don't have the garments. And we're the bride of Christ. Thank God we're saved. We have the, we have the righteousness of Christ through faith. We have the imputed garments. Uh, the Jews one day will get those garments again, and they'll be uh, saved in the tribulation. We saw that in Revelation uh, 6, 11 and 7, 9. And the bride has her garment on, and we've seen that in Revelation 19, uh, 7, 11, 7, 9, 10, 7, 8, 9, 10. And now we go back to our parable, and we see that the children of the kingdom, there's a picture of them being cast out. On one hand, there's an application to today. And so this parable shows up in the kingdom of God parable too later in Luke. You'll see these things in Luke. And some of these things are overlapping. I don't want to get too deep here, but the kingdom of God also has these parables. So there's dual applications. You've got to study your Bible. Many of these parables say the kingdom of God is likened unto. And then they'll say the kingdom of heaven is likened unto. So you've got to look at the nuances. One place says that each man got ten pounds. And they were all, you know, and another place says one got seven pounds and one got five pounds, another got two. And you study these things out and you, and you see there's differences. Why? Because one is applied to the house of Israel and, and her future. And one's talking about God giving the church the blessings of the kingdom of God. So we'll wrap up here. Uh, Matthew chapter 22. And it says, for many are called but few are chosen. And so God's called them, and uh, they had their chance, and many passed by and didn't accept him. Even today people are called, and they're not chosen. The chosen ones have the garments. If you don't have a garment, you don't have Christ's righteousness, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, whether you're even your house of Israel now, or the church, in the future they still need the robes. In the tribulation, they still need God's mercy. They have the faith of Jesus, and they keep the commandments. You still have to have faith in Christ and endure the end there. And so they're going to be called. Not many, are, not many are chosen. Few are chosen, it says. And so, about, I mean, if you apply that today, how many people are truly saved? I mean, you look at all the churches, there's a lot of Christians in general Catholics, Protestants, Orthodox, many have heard the call. Many have heard the gospel. But why aren't they saved? You ask them, are you saved? Well, I hope so. I don't know. I've been baptized. I go to church. That's not the right answer. Have you received the garment of righteousness? Have you received the salvation that's in Christ? And you have to ask yourself that question. You could go to church your whole life and be lost. You could be lost, amen? You need to have righteousness through Christ, faith in his finished blood, finished work in the cross of Calvary through his blood. And so who's chosen? Those that obey, those that receive it and have the garments for it. And so there's a lot of things in here that's not easy to interpret, but we'll end there. Anybody have anything they want to ask or question here of this text? These are difficult texts, I'll admit. Not everything lines out perfectly for me. I have a hard time sometimes, you know, especially when you're thinking, is this apply to the church? Is this apply to Israel? Is this apply to our age? What is this, you know, the kingdom of heaven, we saw back there the pearl of great price. That was the church. But it was still in this period of this world's history. And then we saw one about Israel. We saw one about the church, about the woman who put the leaven in the three lumps until the whole was leavened. So there's things here that uh, you have to really study your Bible, amen? And I hope to get you some pro thought-provoking things this morning to do that. But always bear in mind that there's certain trans, uh, trans what do you call it, uh, transient chap uh, books of the Bible. Matthew is one of those books. Acts is one of those books. Hebrews is one of those books. Why? Hebrews takes you from the church doctrine to the general epistles of James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude, and Revelation is another transitional book. Take you out into eternity. 
So each of these books, four books in the New Testament, you've got to be very careful with who teaches you doctrine from Matthew, Acts, Hebrews, and Revelation. Of course, between Hebrews and Revelation, the general epistles, you have to be careful there too because those are dealing with the house of Israel, the scattered 12 tribes scattered abroad. But these four books is where you're going to see most false doctrine taught. Matthew, Acts, Hebrews, Revelation. You could just about name any doctrine today and it's going to be taken from one of those four books that opposes what Paul taught the church. You get all kinds of nutty stuff out there and it's going to come from Matthew, Acts, Hebrews, and Revelation. Amen. They're not going to go to Philemon or Philippians or 1 Timothy. They're going to go to Hebrews chapter 5, Hebrews chapter 10, you know, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter, uh, uh, what is it? Acts chapter 8, you're going to get people speaking in tongues, Acts. People who are water baptizing for salvation, Acts, Matthew. Uh, You're going to get people teaching you can lose your salvation, Hebrews, James, Revelation, Matthew, right? Almost every heresy today taught is going to be taught from those four books. So you need to be vigilant and study them and understand them. Say, well, I I see this doesn't apply to me doctrinally, and here's why. Amen. And that's helped me out through all the years. Somebody from the Church of Christ comes along, be lined to Acts 2.38. And then when you understand this, you'll be able to say, no, water doesn't save me. Somebody charismatic will come along and show you uh, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 8. And they'll say, you need to speak in tongues to get the initial evidence of the Holy Ghost. And you say, no, that doesn't apply to me. Why? And you explain it to them. If you know your Bible, and that's why we're doing these dispensational divisions, you'll be able to understand where you're at in time and how to explain to other people, too. Anybody have anything as we close this morning? Hope that was a blessing for you this morning. All right, let's go ahead and pray.